Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. Are we doomed to carry our history with us into the future, however unhelpful or painful it is? Or are there ways to successfully leave the bad stuff behind? All three of my guests this week have spent a good deal of time thinking about how best to make our way from a less than perfect past into a better future. Gabrielle Rifkind is a psychotherapist and specialist in conflict resolution, with a long experience in persuading warring factions that yesterday's grievances don't necessarily dictate what happens tomorrow. And the writer and cultural critic Ziadin Sada is an expert in futures studies. He knows that looking ahead can make the world a better place, but also that the wrong kind of vision of the future can make today very unpleasant indeed. We start, though, with Andrew Hussey, whose latest book, The French Intifada, explores the ways that France's violent and troubled colonial history in North Africa still haunt that country. Um, Andrew, your book starts with a riot in the Gare du Nord. Uh, in a lot of respects, it's, it's, a, it's an urban riot that we experienced here in this country. Your argument is that it's very different in character. What, what was it about that event that, that made you use it as the, the starting point for your book? Well, um, I used the starting point of the book as this riot in the Garden of mainly because it impressed me um, in terms of what was happening, the, the, the scale of the violence. But the most important thing was this, was that the riot happened, and you can see it on YouTube... Um, and when I read the papers afterwards, Le Parisien, Le Figaro, Libération, and so on, what really struck me was that the way they were describing the kids who were rioting as saying things like Abali tied down with the state, um, uh, you know, um, Abasakozi, Abali Flika. And I don't remember that happening at all. I remember phrases like Nikle Schmidt and Nikle Kerf, which was attacks on the police. But mm -hmm. above all, I remember something in colloquial Arabic, which I'm going to pronounce really badly because I speak Arabic really badly. But it was, it was a kind of curse against France, Nabu. La France, which is a curse against the whole of France. And it struck me that this was a special quality, if you like, of hatred against France that, that, that intrigued me. Um, and that was, in a, in a way, the starting point for trying to understand what was the nature of this conflict between these kids who came from the Bonnier and, and who, who, who started this riot in the Gare du Nord. Now, the French authorities were rather determined to see that as um, just an example of um, urban deprivation. Their analysis of it was, well, this is, this is poor kids excluded from society. Uh, your analysis is very different, that it, it all stems from the colonial past, or it the, is an the, expression of... That's right, because I think what happens is, what happened is that when the French press reported this as, as to do with social exclusion and marginalisation and all employment, all of which is true, actually, but what they're doing, they're playing into this folklore of insurrection that's part of French history that goes from 1789 to 1830, 1848, right up to May 68. You've got a French tradition of revolt, le peuple, the, the people, and, and it's actually you know, an integral part of what it is to be French, French identity. And what struck me was that this was also something to do with colonialism, the experience of the colonised and the revolt of the colonised against the coloniser. And that's the po point in which the book breaks away from that domestication, if you like, of, of, of urban violence into a completely different history. Yeah, um, I, I would say that this colonialism is not just historic colonialism. It's a colonialism that is very much present in, in French society today. For yeah, example, I, want to, I want to come back to that, but I just want to start by, by detailing the history a little bit because I don't, I don't think English listeners will necess necessarily know this part of history. Maybe, maybe uh, sorry, British listeners, maybe French um, listeners don't know it either, um, if we've got that. But you talk about Algeria principally. And it extraordinarily violent history that it's a very violent history and it's a very difficult history partly because and this is what you know i think english speaking people are not quite uh, aware of is that it was not a straightforward relationship between france and algeria in terms of colonizer and colonized mainly because principally because algeria for a certain part of history was actually part of france it was an integral part of france a département like alsace and i think my my theory is uh, and i think it's true this creates a kind of family relationship or if you like a dysfunctional family relationship and and, and the problem is is what all colonized histories have a problem with identity but what you've got here is is, is something like the double binds that, that contaminate i'm thinking of rd lang or something like that the, the, the double binds that contaminate dysfunctional families so you've got a love hatred thing a conflicted sense of identity and the point i make in the book is that ultimately this is not just about history or politics it's about psychoanalysis or psychotherapy
Um, you, you talk about it being part of France, but of course the status of the uh, of local Algerians was compromised, wasn't it? Always, because it was the colonists who who had all the power yeah, in this situation. Very complex situation in Algeria because it's not simply French people who colonise Algeria. There's also the the, the, the the people who are called Pieds Noirs, who are sort of pan Mediterranean Europeans from Malta, Sardinians. They're called the Black and, Feet because they wore but, but, shiny black leather people, shoes. shoes. Yeah. Yeah, Camus, Albert Camus was part of this 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 population. So you've got the Metropolitan French, you've got the Pieds Noirs, you've got the um, Algerian Muslims who are nationalists mainly. You've also got Berbers. You've got a very multi layered society, but one in which Al Algerians themselves feel lost. And I'll, I'll just sort of finish with this point. Now, I spent quite a bit of time in Algeria. And, and in Algiers in particular, one of the things that strikes me is that this is a French city. The street theatre, uh, the street architecture, the, 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 the way that the city has been designed, it's not like a, a, an Arab city at all. And walking through Algiers, there's no French people, and you feel it's a very Freudian thing, a sense of the uncanny. It's like walking through someone's house, where, where it, which has just been abandoned and all the possessions have been left behind. What does it mean? Uh, yes, Gabriel. Uh, I want to just pick up and link to this idea that you say that it's very psychoanalytic. And I think what we have to ask the question is, how do people construct identity? And how do they see themselves and who do they think they are? Mm. Now, for a, a young man living in the suburbs of, of Paris, where the French culture is to say you have to be culturally French and that there is no respect for your history or your past or where you come from, what you're actually creating is a sense of vacuum. So these young people are almost identity-less. Now, these, you can be sure some of this is actually the seeds of a terrible frustration, the link to violence, marginalisation, exclusion. So there's a very, very important question about how can people create identity so they have a sense of self in which they want to feel part of something. Um, laicity yeah. plays a part in this. This is the French concept of the, the rather fierce defence of secularism within the French state, isn't it? Laicity means that you, you don't recognise religious difference. And for anybody trying to construct their identity based on their religious... Um, beliefs that's that's another difficulty it is there's, there's a cracking novel it's very funny actually by a young moroccan writer called um yusuf al alami i mean and it's called paris mon bled paris my man or something like that and it tells the story of a young moroccan who's, who's never been outside of, of paris and he goes on holiday to casablanca and he's stunned to find it find it's full of moroccans and what this is about is this conflicted identity the thing that gabrielle has just been talking about because it's a globalized phenomenon but it becomes very local very quickly you live in the bonne you're a muslim um you may you smoke weed, you go out with girls, but at the same time, you know, you know that you're not French. This question of laicite, I found it really, really difficult to explain it even to myself, because it's not a concept that we have in the English-speaking world in the same way. It's a very aggressive secularism that means you must be a citizen of France, above all, first of all, or else. Uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, shut up and do what we say. The interesting thing, I want to bring yeah. you in, uh, Ziad, in Sada, Sada, but... Um, it actually has effects on the ground. So the French don't have figures on how many Muslims they have in prison because it's against the regulations to find out. I was amazed. It, it took me ages to get into a French prison, and don't take that the wrong way. It was a lot of negotiation <laughs> and hard work. But I was amazed when I was doing research in a French prison that they don't know how many Muslims are in They can't know. Uh, they to do with halal food, but maybe people eating halal food because the prison food is rubbish anyway. Yeah. Nobody's monitoring the texts that are coming into prison. And as the director of, of Fren Prison, who's, who's, a, who's a woman, the directrice, told me even the Russian gangsters claim to be Muslims just because they can get better food. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, then, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to go back to the point, the point, point of city landscapes I, because I think the identity is constructed from, from the city landscape. If you look at what the French did in the colonies, what they did was when they went there, they saw the Medina and they said Medina is a place where all the backward, you know, uh, people who are confused, who are not part of modernity, actually live. So they constru constructed suburbs outside there, where modernity was there, and, and it was an isolated, enclave place where they could live. Back in France, the geography is reversed. So, so the center of the Paris is now the inviolate zone where modernity and civilization exist, and suburbs have been constructed where all these backward, nasty people actually live. The bon so, yeah, where bon you, yeah. Right. So you find that in I, I, I was during the riots. I was in in, in Lille, and and you, when you go to these places, they are like battery hatches. I mean, it's like factory farming hands 
and deliberately constructed to, to keep the backward people in their backward space. Well, this, this and hence the identity becomes a very impor important, important problem. And the landscape, the cities themselves, produce this separateness and this otherness Presumably that can never not, be reconciled. Not, not deliberately constructed as an urban prison, no, no, but, but, it, but in, in, a sense, in the events. No, 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 no. I, well, I, like, I, would argue, I, I would argue that colonialism comes back both as a structure and as policies. So it is to some extent deliberately constructed. Well, I was wandering around the Bonnier recently um, uh, when I was writing the book. The, the word prison was coming up all the time. And, and my way into the book actually was in the 1980s because I was a student in Lyon. I come from Manchester University. Um, and when the first urban riots kicked off, which was in Lyon, in a suburb called Vaux on Valam. And, and why I wrote the book partly was to explain my, to myself 30 years on what was the nature of this violence. And I remember vividly in the 80s, and I went back recently to Vaux on Valam, it's like a science fiction dystopia. Yeah. The Bonya. Yeah. It's not designed to be bad, but it is bad. It creates bad feelings. And a lot of this is about emotions. It's not just about unemployment or, or bad urbanism. It's also about the actual extreme emotions that are created by these places. And I think, going back to the psychoanalytical point, a lot of human beings fear much more than death. They fear annihilation, the annihilation of their identity. And that's what I think a lot of this revolt in France has been about. Uh, Gabriel, I think you are taking away my point. That is actually what I would, I would have said. Mm. But the whole question about the power of the group and how you create a particular culture that reinforces itself and how that closes down. The other bit, and I'm not sure you explore it in the book, is the question of technology and how that affects how you create identity. And by the click of a mouse, you can now connect with uh, North Africans and communicate with them. So if you're already feeling angry and alienated, you've got a very, very large peer group to relate to. Conversely... The technology can open up minds. But what we're seeing at the moment, because we haven't got creative enough around it, is how it's being used to reinforce identity. Well, yeah, one of the guiding theories behind the book is nothing to do with um, colonialism or, or, or anything like that. It's Guy Debord, The Society of the Spectacle. I wrote a biography of Guy Debord some time ago. And Guy Debord's big idea is that we live in this, this world that he calls the spectacle that controls us, but at the same time alienates us. And I don't think there's any better example of that physically than the Parisian um, or the Lyonnais Bonneux, where you can connect with the click of a mouse to Casablanca, to Algiers, to Tunis, but at the same time feel devalued and, as I said before, feel annihilated in terms of who you really are. And I, I like in your book the way you talk about biography rather than history. Mm. Um, because that's what it's about. It's about the story that you tell yourself to explain who you are. Um, in a lot of cases, um, particularly in, in Algeria, and as you're talking about Algeria, a lot of these movements start as nationalist movements, um, not specifically religious. Uh, later they become more religious, yeah, um, it, an Islamist um, element comes into it. Uh, that's critical, isn't it? Um, I mean, when Camus is, is um, writing about the first nationalist movements, he says, you know, terrorism can be explained by a lack mm, of hope. Mm. A little later, he's mm. talking about Algeria as the Munich of the left because he says you don't know what you're supporting here. And, and I think that still applies to a certain, amount, to, to a certain extent, the Munich of the left. Got to be careful here. Uh, just explain, I mean, what do you understand him to have meant by that? Well, what Camus meant by that was, was that um, the left was conflicted and, and hesitant about actually stepping in and making a decision about where they stood on colonialism. Um, and, it, it, you know, the, the left in, in France splintered around that. The point so their, their sympathies were with the nationalists uh, but, but, but they and splintered. the anti-colonialists. Yeah. But they, they hadn't recognised that behind that was Islam something that was at odds with all yeah, of the values they espoused. Ex exactly, yeah. But I've got to be clear about this, that radical Islam is an import into North Africa. The local version of Islam in North Africa is Malachite Islam, which is traditionally very tolerant. It's, it's full of yeah. folklore and, you know, they've got saints and musicians and, and all of that kind of thing. So that there's this phenomenon of globalisation with the import of radical Islam. We forget that that's a symptom of modernity or post-modernity as much as anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's a great deal to do with hope. As you see hopes slip away, you become more and more extreme. And when you have absolutely no hope, then extremism reigns supreme in that sense. So what we see, the kind of emergence of Islamic fundam fundamentalism, is very much a kind of lack of hope, how, how, how modernity is perceived. And in fact, uh, uh, in, in a very strong sense, it is perceived as it is not for us. We are excluded from modernity. Modernity is something out there. It's and if, especially if in, in the case of France, where civilization is defined as being French, 
you know, everybody else is by definition non-civilized. And so you have the case where, where a woman wearing a Gucci scarf, you know, walking on a catwalk or even walking in the streets is regarded as height of fashion. But the same Gucci scarf on, a, on, a, on the head of a Muslim woman then suddenly becomes threat to civilization and has to be banned from all public spaces. Uh, Gabrielle, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I link with that very much because I think when there isn't a vision of the future and, uh, as you say, hope, then you become identified with the past or you become locked in the past. Uh, you think of the Battle of Kosovo or Sunni Shiite conflicts. And, and so your identity becomes more fixed in, in the past. And the question is, how do we actually unlock this and create some kind of vision for the future? We're going, um, because we're, it, go, it, go, it yes. goes, just to, to, to make the point, what happens is when you get locked in the past, it's a more of a passive state. It's yeah. more victim-like. It's yeah. more what has been done to you. Whereas if we open up the imagination for the future, yeah. it is about agency and feeling that we, you can influence. I, 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 I want to I move on. Agree with you more. I want yeah. to move on to uh, the future, but uh, just before we do, um, I think we have to uh, address the particular nature of the violence in Algeria and the extremity of it, but also uh, another uncomfortable sense of in which these um, people identify themselves which is anti-semitism now this is something that the french take to algeria to to a degree you have a character a, a very popular character a sort of fictional character called kayagu he sounds like Giordone to me exactly the sort of anti-everything attitude deep anti-semitism hugely popular in algeria Sort of in the 19th century. That's, that's a very good point. Kaga used to just be professorial and pronounce yeah, it correctly. <laughs> Kaga used was a co comic character from the 19th century in, in Algeria, very popular and rapidly anti Semitic, as you would expect to be in, in, in a place where Edouard Drummond's La France Juive is, is one of the guiding texts. Bringing it bang up to date, there's nothing new about the Dieudonné affair. He's the comedian who we know who um, has got launched this famous canal that Nicolas Anelka used and all of this kind of stuff. The real danger of Dieudonné is that he speaks directly to the Bonnier and he speaks directly to the Bonya in terms of negationisme, which is a French word meaning Holocaust denial. And there was a brilliant article in Le Monde the other week by Michel Dreyfus, the uh, aptly named historian, who pointed out that the real danger here is that what Dieudonné is promulgating is a negationisme de masse. He's taking negationism to the masses. Now, it's one thing to have an occult conspiracy theory against Jews that nobody's listening to, but when you light it up, when you light the torch that spreads it through hundreds of thousands of people, it's looking like the 1930s in a very dangerous way. Um, the other thing, uh, just to come back to, is this um, the degree of violence in Algeria, because it wasn't, as it were, uh, I don't know whether there is such a thing as ordinary terrorism. It seemed to take on a, a psychotic sense of display, um, particularly in the most recent um, kind of Algerian civil war, that both sides were intent on displaying that they could do worse than the other side. Where did that come from? Or, or another word, psychotic, um, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a dangerous word. Um, what about spectacular? That there was an element even of competition to, to ratchet up. Uh, Martin Amos uses a brilliant phrase as well. Not terrorism, but horrorism. And it's about ratcheting up the, 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 the horror as a weapon of war. That's what was happening in Algeria. And that partly explains it, I think. Gabriel Rifkin, do you, does your sort of psychological knowledge feed into this? What, what is happening when somebody decapitates a teacher and puts the head on the desk in front of her pupils? Yeah. When you've got that level of disturbance in your society, when it has become so deeply traumatised that actually what you want to happen is you want the other side to suffer more than you. It, it, it's a way of using your power when actually you feel extremely weak. I mean, if we look at what's happening in Syria now, I'm sure we could see comparisons. War creates the most degenerative kinds of behaviour, the, the sort of deterioration in which people are baying for blood, seeking retribution. And the, and the last thing they want to do is compromise and make peace. But that's what, what you see, and that's why things like, if we can get smarter in terms of earlier intervention, that once people are in this mindset, people do horrendous things to each other. Um, Ziad and Sadar, your, part of your expertise is trying to find ways in which you look ahead of you and yeah. see not the same thing happening again. I mean, yeah. you've written this um, this short monograph about, um, it's called Future, 
Um, but it's essentially about the boom in future studies, which is partly yeah. technocratic, but it's also about kind of thinking, thinking of ways in which we can move forward and plan for a better future. Absolutely. I think uh, unless you look towards the future, you're not going to solve the conflicts of the past. In a sense, what you need to do is to transcend the conflicts of the past. And the way you do that is you acknowledge the, the truths of, of history, in a sense. And, and you and use I, the plural there. And, right? I, and I emphasize the plural because there's not a single truth. In, in any particular conflict, you will, you will, you will have competing truths and they, all, they will all have validity. So you need to acknowledge that, in um, a sense, and then transcend them. Uh, and they don't necessarily all have equal validity, do they? They may not have equal valid validity, but those uh, uh, the, the contended forces would argue that their their truths are as valid as the truth of uh, as the truth of others in that sense. So, in in a sense, you have to realize that the plurality of of of, of truths uh, and the complexity of the present, uh, and then imagine a kind of future where you can actually. In you know, solve some of these problems. And, and the, the, the important point here, I think, is to make is that the problems cannot be solved either in history or in the present. They can only be solved in the future. And by future, I mean a multi-generation future, like at least 20 years, which is a generation. So it's, it's the next generation that is going to solve the, solve the problems. So you've got to have some sort of vision of the future, of what, this, what kind of society we want, how can we all come together and live together and transcend the the conflicts of that history. That gives you a number of problems, doesn't it? Uh, One, I mean, which you acknowledge is that the, the future can be colonised. Um, people, people have arguments about it. They try to kind of win, yeah. as it were, the battle for the future. You can also have very bad ideas about the future. You can have, for example, I mean, it is, you know, what the Al-Qaeda's Al idea of the future Absolutely. is a new caliphate. Absolutely. Now, that, yeah. that sanctions extreme violence now. So uh, uh, you have to have ways of judging. What absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, you know, you could construct a utopia with the best of intentions and it, 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 it turns out to be a nightmare. Utopians, most most you, utopians, you, utopians, utopians do, utopians, don't they? Utopians, <laughs> utopians do. So I think you need to acknowledge two or three things. It's first that your vision of the future cannot be a monolithic entity, right? It must be consensual. So in the sense that the conflicting... Uh, uh, segments of society have to come together and develop a consensus and then argue uh, uh, and, and the vision is not fixed. The future is not fixed in a sense. It's a very dynamic uh, uh, kind of entity. It, it, has, it, it, can, it can come, it can be realized in a number of different alternatives and you have to kind of some understanding of what, these, uh, what alternatives are, are possible in a sense. A great deal of future, I mean the way it's colonized is, is that great deal of future simply extended present. So, for example, if you want future with robots and, and better iPhones and so on and so forth, well, that's probably what we'll get in the next 10 years. But that's basically not really a, a, not really a different future. It's an extension of the present. So a great deal of the future is, ex is, is extended present. And somehow, if you really want a, a, a better alternative, then you need to get away from this notion of the ex extended present. Here's the catch-22, though. We can make reasonable predictions about the near future, but only small changes. Uh, we can make terrible predictions about the distant future, but things that we do now might have a very, very large consequence. Mm -hmm. There's a difficulty there, isn't there? Because we don't know whether we're doing the right thing or not. Uh, absolutely. So I think we shouldn't predict at all. <laughs> I, okay. I, 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 I think we shouldn't, but we should be aware of the trends that are, that are emerging and how do we analyse and what direction they are, they are, they're actually you know, taking us. We can look at the future simply as a river. Right, where you're just flowing the co following the contours of the river. If if there's a rapid, you know, you, you negotiate rapids. If there's a fall in in front, you kind of try and try, try and predict the fall. But I think we need to get away from this kind of fixed notion of of the future as a river. We need to imagine the future as a, as a sea where you can sail in any particular direction. So, so but you're, you do you're need, becoming less passive. You're becoming less passive, uh, and it's much more an active thing. Moreover, you, you you need to have some sort of kind of you know compass to take you there, some sort of navigation tools and so on and so forth. And these are your values and the consensus you develop within, within your society. Um, you use this phrase backcasting um, as yeah. opposed to forecasting. Just yes. explain what backcasting is. Well, in, in normal forecasting, we take, we take trends and we say uh, these are the trends and, di and in 10, 12 years, 20 years time, this is where we'll be. So that's kind of forecasting. In backcasting, you, you start from a, from a vision of the future. Which, which, which I said earlier on, you develop through consensus. It has to be a, a socially consensus co constructed vision. It cannot be just what you want because your neighbor may, may want something different. 
and the society, other elements of society may want something different. So you have a vision that is based on some sort of consensus. And you start from the vision and you work backwards. So instead of forecasting, you backcast. But backcasting involves as much planning as forecasting. So you, you plan backwards and you start and you come right, you know, if you, if you have a say, vision of, of 2040, you start with 2040 and you imagine what you need to do in 2049, sorry, 2039 and 2038 right to now, then it, then it empowers you. So you know exactly what to do now. So you want to get up now and do something that triggers a chain of reaction that will take you to the next step. Uh, it sounds wonderfully idealistic. But no, but in fact, it's, no, it's very, it, very practical. How, in fact, it's much there more practical. Has there been a practical application Absolutely. Of it? I mean, backcasting is a, is, 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 is a big thing. Even corporations now are, are now see, seeing the value of, of, of backcasting. Backcasting is frequently used uh, when you have a, a community uh, that, is, uh, 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 that is kind of facing a very specific problem or, or a number of specific, specific problems. And you say, how are we going to, how are we going to solve that? So it's been used in, in a number of communities in Philippine, fishing communities in Philippines, in, 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 in unemployed communities in Scotland, uh, uh, you know, in a number of places in, in, in Australia. So it's, it's, it's not an idealistic... It's a real, it's, it's, a real, it's, it's real a world very, it's, it's solution. It's a real, real world solution. But it does have elements of idealism because unless you are idealistic to some extent, you don't have hope. And the future, especially you know, looking towards the future, is all about hope. And Gabriel Rifkin. Yeah, to I actually, Tom, wanted to um, link to an earlier point you made about the danger is if you ask people to vision for the future, perhaps we'll get an Al-Qaeda vision, um, some, something like a caliphate. And I think what, what we have to be very, very aware of here is with trauma, it takes three generations um, for, for, for people to move on and lead ordinary lives. Now, of course, governments can't plan in that way. But what we can be committed to is everything to do to try and stop violence in, in the community. And there are much, much smarter ways of intervening to try and stop this violence because it is the violence that actually creates these very extreme visions for the future. Well, also it locks it in place. I mean, it is the case sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I, so I, I would argue that, 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 that they're not really a visions of the future at all. We kept on mentioning Al-Qaeda and, and the Khilafat. It's not a vision of the future. It's a vision of history. It's historic notions projected into the future. That's not, that's, that's not, that's not what I mean by, 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 by vision of the future. But for those by, people, by, but, yeah, no, it's not yeah. what you mean, but it yeah. is what they mean. Yeah, no, <laughs> but I mean, it, it's, it's very much recreating history. It's, it's, it's not appreciating future and what 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 future may, may actually bring in the sense. Yes, uh, Sorry, I was going to ask, ask Gabrielle. I mean, how does this work in concrete terms? I'm, mm. I'm interested to know how, how do you bring people in a conflict situation together? How do you how do you get them talking? How do you get them talking? Yeah, I mean, how do you get people to sit together who want to kill each other? Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think what's important here is what you do quietly off the record behind the scenes, outside the glare of publicity. And we have, uh, we, when I say we, Oxford Research Group, has been committed to do this in a n number of different situations in the, in the Palestine-Israel conflict, and we did a lot of work um, before the negotiations on, on, on Iran in which we got parties to sit together um, now. What, your, your point is what happens when people hate hate each other and want want to kill each other. First of all, I don't think you can always work with the people who have been that traumatised. You do have to work with people who have some kind of vision of the future. Um, and what? But you'd also need to um, recognise that the history, the competing narratives, and the different ways of seeing things. If people are going to imagine a future. Uh, in fact, one of, one of the problems in the Palestine-Israel conflict, and I'm always a bit nervous about mentioning that because it always creates such intense emotions on either side, is that people are very trapped in, in their own histories, their own experiences, and it's very hard for them to imagine any kind of fe uh, uh, vision of the future in which they are going to manage to live together. Um, yes, yeah. Adar, yeah. you had a very useful phrase in your book. You quote James Data, um, any useful idea about the future should appear to be ridiculous. Absolutely. I mean, this is classically the case about <laughs> peace, isn't it? If yeah. you'd said yeah. Jerry Adams will sit down yeah. and shake hands with Ian Paisley at one yeah. time, you would have been... Yeah. 
uh, called uh, a lunatic. Uh, 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 absolutely. Uh, I, I think, in a sense, you do need to find ways and means to bring people to people together. If, for example, if you brought a, a group of young Israelis and a group of young Palestinians and asked them to imagine a future, yes. Yes. right? Uh, it is it is not unlikely that they will produce, to begin with, they will produce diametrically opposite futures. But when they start talking to each other and say, look, hang on, our children and our grandchildren have to live in this particular space, they will start negotiating and constructing and through the process of conversation uh, over a period of time, a, a future will emerge, which they will all subscribe to, in a sense. But you need to go through the process. The process is, itself is very, very important. And the process then becomes a way of dealing with trauma and dealing with yeah. the problems of history. But you think what you're saying is at the moment when there's conflict, people get locked in identities around nationalism and their religious identities. When people actually have real human connecting relationships, yeah. actually they realise there are multiple identities. There are many ways in which they connect. You know, they might connect as young doctors or some kind of way in which they can collaborate with the future. Yeah. What happens is, is conflict hardens identity. Yeah, um, uh, Gabriel, I, 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 that's one of the points about, about we were talking about visions earlier on. You have to start with the, with the present to some extent. And in the present, uh, multiple identities are a priori given. You cannot start with, 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 with monolithic identity. And that's what I think is a problem with, with France, where, where, where there's only one way of defining what is French in that sense. And unless France accepts that there are multiple selves, there are multiple identities. I, for example, have a number of different identities, and I'm quite happy to be British, quite happy to be Muslim, quite happy to be a futurist, quite happy to be Islamic scholar, and so on and so forth. Uh, unless people can recognize that multiple identities exist and we need to go forward from these multiple identities. Um, and we're not going to have a viable notion. Andrew, Andrew Hussey, your book ends on a very um, bleak note. It says, you, you say, it may be that what France needs is not hard-headed political solutions or even psychiatry, but an exorcist. Uh, now... <laughs> to cast out <laughs> demons. So, yeah, um, what do you mean by that? It is what um, Azir is talking about, what you had in mind, a kind of truth and reconciliation commission or... It sounds it sounds bleak because because it, it is bleak, but I don't think it's irredeemably bleak. I think there is a future in France, and I think it's to do with exercising demons. It's casting out demons, which is a metaphor, in a way, for coming to terms with trauma. That's what I really mean by that. And it's generational. And you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Bonio. There's a lot of good stuff going on in the Bonio. There's a lot of good people in the Bonio. And I think what's really interesting is the phrase that the French use, which again is difficult to translate, communitarisme, which is about identity politics. It act actually, a new France is being created out in the in the Bonio, and that's what threatens the old France, which is at the centre. Um, Gabrielle Rifkin, I want to turn to you, um, Director of the Middle East Program at Oxford Research Group, and you've written this book called The Fog of Peace. The kernel of this book is that it's, it's humans that are at the core of um, peacemaking, which sounds obvious in one sense, but your point is that it's, it's very often very small human hurts that are at the centre of kind of geopolitical uh, conflicts. You say, you know, conflict is often motivated by small hurts and wounded pride, not big ideological beliefs. Yeah, uh, um, because it, it's not actually institutions who decide to go to war or to make peace. It is actually done by individuals. Now, the book doesn't deny realpolitics. It doesn't deny competing sources of power or even the smell of politics. And, and we have to place all this in the, in the political system if, if we're going to have impact. But the individual matters for so many reasons. Uh, and one of them is the whole nature of war is changing. It used to be state to state. It's now asymmetrical where you have the powerless often fighting the powerful. Now, one of the things that's very important here is the powerless have often been at the heart of the conflict. They've often had many members of their families killed and are deeply traumatised. The powerful are not actually engaged in the war and neither are their children. So unless you start from that position with this inequality and the way in which particular groups have been traumatised, you're not actually going to be able to move on and uh, and get to any kind of peacemaking. Now, what, what, what West, Western governments do, and they possibly do it unwittingly, is they want to talk to men in grey suits. They want to talk to people who think like that us. We always want to do this. 
But in practice, there are always competing narratives and there are histories and there are reasons why we've got to this position. And so we have to start from this position. Um, there's a paradox, though, isn't there, in this book, because you, you rightly say that everything has to be fed through the psychology of the individual, mm. whether it's the individual who turns up at mm. the peace talks mm. and will have a certain psychology, mm. a certain history mm. themselves. But at the same time, you do talk about... Uh, you use the phrase at one point, or you quote somebody using the phrase, the Persian psyche. You know, there is this notion mm-hmm. of states mm-hmm. having a psychology. Mm-hmm. How can states have a psychology? Oh, I, I mean, or is I, that just a metaphor that's yeah, got no, out no, of hand? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't just say it's... I don't say it's just about the in, individual narrative. I think it's also about the group narrative. It's also about how the state sees and de- defines itself. Um, Iran so is, when you talk about Israel yeah. having a, a, a effectively kind of post-traumatic yes. condition because of the Holocaust. Yes. Um, how does that operate? In, in, in How does that metaphor work? I don't... Well, I think... I'm trying it, to pin down how, yeah, how it what, what is... What does it actually mean in, in practice when you've got a, a yeah. collective trauma? Um, well, I think, I think certainly in the Israeli psyche, there's a kind of sense of never again. Never again will we be so weak and vulnerable in which six million people died. Of course, there's a problem in that because there's a kind of hardening of we will not have this done to us. And it's also not the conditions in which you make peace because peacemaking is that you both, you have to recognise actually what's happened in the histories and possibly in the trauma of both sides. Now, when you've been traumatised yourself, the last thing you want to do is to get into the mind of the other. And this is why we argue very, very strongly for the need for third-party credible mediators. We actually say in this book, The Fog of Peace, we talk about the need for some international institute of mediation. Now, we mean something quite big, in fact, where you have commando teams of diplomats on the ground, embedded, people who are coming... So you're you're not... um, You you do actually use the the phrase commando mediators, which is the idea that you go in very fast, very right fast. at the beginning before yes. things. So yes. in Ukraine now they would all be in there. But yes. Would they have been there on the ground from five years ago when you say embedded? Well, uh, you would have started uh, the process you, you, already. Absolutely. Um, in the Ukraine there was always a, a competing narrative between the Russians and the Europeans about how they were going to move forward. But I actually would like to talk about Syria because whilst this is a horrendous c- civil war um, you Actually, it's a proxy war, and this is something we understood very early on. And the the real the real war is between Saudi Arabia and Iran, who are fueling the the violence, are supporting extreme groups with the flow of weapons and money. And what we needed was very careful behind the scenes mediation, extremely early on, and it would have needed to be sustained and long term. And about what kind of vision was there going to be around? how the Sunni and Shiite communities were going to live together. Now, I'm not sure governments can do this. This is why we need credible third-party institutions. They partly can't do it because they don't feel it's necessary until the shots are fired, don't yeah. they? they uh, don't, because it, we live in a world of crisis management where we can just about keep up in our minds what's going on. And that's why, if we got a lot, lot smarter on early intervention and what that would look like... Um, in fact, we spend 1.7 trillion on the military at this point, as much as as it, as it costs to run the state of Germany. If we got much, much smarter in behind the scenes mediation, credible third party mediators, but yeah. very serious about it. Uh, uh, how, how, how would your commando diplomats kind of differ from, say, United Nations? Isn't uh, United yeah. Nations a, a, a kind of institution that already exists that ought to be doing that? It's a good question, and uh, maybe it doesn't matter where, where they're embedded, but at the moment, the, all of this is very bureaucratic, and we need something much more agile and nimble and responsive um, when, when the conflict's brewing, and that, that you need the kind of people who alert and understand the complexity of of it because it, bureaucratic systems don't manage to do this. You don't go in 
after the conflicts erupted. You have mediators in, in each area of conflict already working carefully, working with the local population as a but, but given how many conflicts there are in the world, you're asking for a, a half the world to be a mediator. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have armies of mediators. Yeah. Uh, it's Rather much than better armies than of our armies of drones. Oh. Can I, can I, I, wa I want to ask you all uh, a, a question. I don't know whether it'll be our final question, but we're coming towards the end of the programme. Um, are there not occasions when we've been talking a lot about empathy, empathy for the other side, a sense of a plural sense of what the truths are, recognition of other people's narratives. Are there not occasions when intransigence is justified? I mean, for example, there are people who argue that um, the secular state in France, whatever its downside, actually creates a safe space for all. Uh, and that there are great virtues to that. And it's central to that sense of what, what it is to be French and part of that kind of enlightened enterprise. Are there not occasions when we need to just say, actually, no compromise? Well, you have to weigh up what the price is of no compromise. If it's violence and endless violence and endless com conflict, that maybe you do have to integrate other people's narratives. The price is just too high. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 no, I, I disagree. I, I don't think there can be any occasion when you say no compromise. Compromise is always there. You need to find and find and find and discover it. In fact, the contemporary world, with all the chaotic behavior that that we see, all the complexity we see, demands that we are flexible and 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 and, and malleable. So even if you're going back to to French uh, French secularism, unless the French. Uh, uh, notion of secularism accepts the fact that there are going to be multiple identities and there are dif even different ways to be secular uh, there, is, there is no future for it in my opinion Can you see them doing that Andrew Hussey? No France? I can't but I think they should <laughs> and I think what we've got to remember is laicite was brought in the, 19th, the end of the 19th century as a way of policing and discipline in the Catholic Church it worked then mm -hmm. but it doesn't work in the 21st century mm -hmm. where you've got the complex kind of mobile agile warfare fought with symbols and language rather than guns and weapons that um, Gabrielle has just described OK, well, I don't know whether we have arrived at a negotiated settlement, but uh, we don't have any time for further discussions. Thank you to all my guests. Andrew Hussey's The French Intifada, The Long War Between France and Its Arabs, and Gabrielle Rifkin's The Fog of Peace, The Human Face of Conflict, are both out now. Ziadin Sadar's essay on the future is part of the All That Matters series. Next week, decision-making with the Nobel Prize-winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman, Michael Ignatieff, Lisa Opinionese and Henry Marsh. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.